Hello, this is Lauren with our constituent care team. I pray that your Christmas season was and continues to be a blessed time with family and friends leading into a joyous new year. Hello, I'm Anna and I'm with the donor relations team. First, I want to say thank you for being a part of JDFI and listening. And I pray that this new year for you is full of wonderful surprises from the Lord. Happy New Year. Hi, this is Roger Marsh for Family Talk with some exciting news. We've selected 18 of the most popular broadcasts of the past year and present them to you together on six audio CDs in the 2019 Family Talk Best of Broadcast Collection. Join Dr. Dobson and many incredible guests like Dennis Prager, Rebecca Gregory, and Rabbi Jonathan Kahn in this compelling audio collection. You can get your CD set as our thank you for your gift of any amount in support of our ministry. Join Dr. Dobson in serving families. Call 877-732-6825 or visit Dr. James dobson.org. Welcome to Family Talk, the radio ministry of the James Dobson Family Institute. I'm Roger Marsh, thanking you for joining us today for what is going to be a very special radio program. Throughout the entire month of December, we are highlighting the broadcasts that were the most listened to during the past year. So sit back and enjoy this popular program from 2019 right here on the special edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Today on Family Talk. When our beliefs come under attack, Scripture reminds us to be wise and speak with grace and love. However, with the infiltration of dangerous ideologies into our everyday lives, we can quickly become hostile. As believers, we must be vigilant in identifying and defending our faith against this culture. God's Word is the basis for our lives, and we must prevent any attempt to change, undermine, or directly attack it. But there is a certain element of understanding and kindness that we must exude when guarding our faith. We just learned about the grace I just spoke of through part one of Dr. James Dobson's conversation with Ravi Zacharias, one of the most respected and recognizable names on earth in regards to apologetics. Over 35 years ago, Ravi was burdened to properly educate the church on effectively defending the faith, so he founded Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. He also recently started an apologetics training center in Atlanta, Georgia, called the Zacharias Institute. Ravi is a prolific, best-selling author and has a new book out called The Logic of God. He has traveled to numerous countries worldwide, teaching and sharing the gospel with millions of people. What you're about to hear is the second part of his conversation with Dr. Dobson, and it centers around America's future. We'll begin with a quick recap of yesterday's content, which centers on Ravi's newest work. This is Family Talk, a ministry of the James Dobson Family Institute. You have this new book, The Logic of God, 52 Christian Essentials for the Heart and Mind. Tell us about it. Yes, it's one of the most unusual books uh, that I've done out of the various volumes. And your works, I still go back, Jim, to the early days when you are turn your heart toward home and so on. I still remember the church. I was sitting and watching it, and what a journey Uh it's been. And you've left a legacy with those books. Uh, you know, kind, long, yeah, long Ravi. after we're all gone, people will be reading those books. Whose books am I reading? People who've long gone, you know, you're reading Spurgeon, you're reading Wesley, you're reading Mugridge, you're reading People Chesterton. ask me how I've changed through the years. I say, I hate to admit it, but not at all. I haven't changed. No. I believe what I believed then, and I believe it the way I believed it then, and I will till the day I die. Because it was the truth. It was the truth. And you don't truth. compromise. So in this book, what I did, When I do my devotions, I've had different journeys for my devotional life every year. It used to be through go through the Bible every year. It used to be go through the great chapters. used to go through the great books of salvation or Pauline epistles or whatever. But I found there was too much material to process every day. I'm the kind of reflective person. I don't like to just take a verse and memorize it and tomorrow it's on to a next verse. I like to chew on the substance, think about it, go through for a few days. So I felt it would be great to have a devotional pattern of one devotional a week, every Monday. I'd originally called the book, Thank God It's Monday, but the publishers didn't like it, so I (laughs) called it The Logic of God. Every Monday you take a devotional and through the week process it in your mind and grow through it, and next Monday you move on to the next one. So it's 52 devotionals to stir the mind with the way God's thoughts are sent to us. The Bible tells us his thoughts are not our thoughts. And if you have the paradigm on how God thinks on these issues, 
that paradigm shift takes place in our own mind, whether it's a problem of pain. We talk so much about the problem of pain. What's really got us into a mess is we've never thought of the problem of pleasure. That you know, is true. We don't have boundaries set. We want to push back the barricades, and then we wonder how did we end up in this mess. So those are the kinds of subjects we deal with and hope. People are sending back good responses to it, and I have to say my dear research assistant, Danielle, was particularly helpful in collating the stuff that I had written over the years, so I have to give her my heartfelt thanks. Ravi, you're here in Colorado Springs to speak at the Summit Ministry. Those who have followed me through the years, even back to the Focus on the Family days, know that I love that ministry and have supported it in every way I could because it played such a key role in the life of my son, Ryan, and what it did for him when he was 17 years of age. It just clarified many things for him and set him on the path. And you're going to be there to speak uh, tonight, I assume. Yes, sir. Actually, it's a dialogue with Dennis Prager. Dennis and I have done a My, few programs what a together. What change that so, would be. <laughs> so it'll be, you on, know, he's, a, he's, an, he's an amazingly engaging person. I love Dennis. I've listened he to spent him. a whole day here with us Did just he really? recently. Okay. Yeah. Very kind to us evangelical Christians. Actually, the first time I heard my wife was a great follower of Dennis, and so we went on a cruise uh, where Dennis was the speaker. I, I didn't even know him, and then somebody told him I was on the ship, and he was very kind, invited me to join him for dinner, and then introduced me to the people who were on that ship. They were all there to hear him, and uh, I just am fascinated by how good he is at what he does and how clear he is in what he says. And now with this Prager University, he's just breaking new ground. So I'm here for that. But to go back to Summit, yeah, they're the ones sponsoring it. You know, they were one of the trailblazers uh, and nothing is as testimonially rich as for somebody who says, you know, my son or my daughter was blessed by them, as you have said. But they realized how critical it is on our campuses and how important it is to be preemptive in your thinking, to be prepared before you face the full brunt of the attack. Now, Dennis so, is an Orthodox Jew. Are you going to talk about Jesus? Yeah, I'm sure we will. Uh, <laughs> when a question comes from the floor, Dennis is very kind. And in fact, I noticed in my itinerary, I didn't know that was there. A few weeks down the line, we are somewhere else. I don't know if it's California or what, and it's called Ask a Jew, Ask a Gentile. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so when it comes to, uh, I remember once a question came, we were at uh, the Biola campus, and a question came up from the floor on what worship means to both of us, you know, and Dennis very humorously said, that's Ravi's expertise. So he <laughs> passed it on to and me. And his expertise is the, the Torah, and I mean, he knows those yeah. books of the Bible. Yeah. Well, I find it fascinating when he expounds on that. You know, we stand on the shoulders of uh, the Hebrew Scriptures. Absolutely. And uh, I had a great one-hour discussion with uh, Ben Shapiro as well, you mm -hmm. know, and that had uh, a huge listening audience, and Ben was very kind. And even uh, Dennis, I'll, I'll never forget when he talked about um, when Messiah comes, he said, I'm going to have just one question for him. Have you been here before? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good way to put it. So I said, Dennis, you're still open then. That is possible that he has already been here before for you to ask that question. But, you know, he is not intimidating and he's not intimidated by the truths. When you really look at the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, okay, Genesis, our beginnings. Exodus, our redemption. Leviticus, the priesthood story, how we need the mediator. Numbers, the statistical story of what happens. Deuteronomy, the place of the law. All of that is put right in in the first five books of Moses. And I just always say to those who talk to me from the Hebrew perspective, just remember, redemption preceded righteousness. Mm. You cannot find salvation by obedience to the law. The law is like a mirror. It'll tell you your face is dirty, but you have to go to the faucet to wash it. Clean. And so that's what the gospel message is all about. It provides the cleansing. You know, Shirley and I are reading the first five books of the Bible again. We finished uh, the New Testament and we turned around and started over as we always yeah. do. And we're into Exodus 
I shared this with somebody the other day, but this was very meaningful to me. I think it's the second chapter of Exodus, and the Scripture says that the people were oppressed by slavery, and they were crying out in their pain and in their sorrow and in their loss. And the Scripture says God heard their cry and was concerned about them. If he was concerned about them, is he concerned about me? And, and you and the people who are suffering out there, does he hear their cries? He certainly does, and I found that very uplifting. Well, you know, this repeatedly we hear, the cry of the people has come up to me. You know, it's a very, very beautiful analogical use of language to remind us that like a father, he listens. I'll have a personal question for you. When in each day do you and Shelley have your devotions together? Do you do it at the beginning of the day? Do you do it at the end of the day? How do you do we it? We like to do it early okay. before we get too tired. You okay. know, so yeah. uh, I, I love those times together uh, because the scriptures uh, open up to us in ways that we've never seen before. And we've been both of us believers, she since she was six and me since I was four. And so I've been raised with the scriptures, and yet they're new every day. Indeed. Well, that's beautiful, and I guess you've been practicing that for years. Well, it's important because God gave us a book, and he gave us the Holy Spirit. And if we disregard that book and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we're disregarding two of the greatest gifts that he's left for us, his truth and his presence. That's really what the Christian walk is all about that thy word is truth. Truth is primarily a property of propositions, but the Holy Spirit is the indwelling presence that guards your heart and your emotions. So the objective truth and the subjective Uh response are hand in hand in, in God's revelation. Well, let me tell our listeners that I'm Dr. James Dobson. This is Family Talk, and I'm uh, talking today with Ravi Zacharias, a man that I respect as highly as anybody in the country because of the work that he's done in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's talk about America, Uh, Ravi. What's happening here? I am deeply concerned about the spiritual Uh, integrity of this nation. And I'm told that uh, the churches are losing their influence. Uh, Just uh, several days ago, I saw a poll that was taken by the Rasmussen polling group, and uh, they said the traditional Christian values of faith, family, and freedom are losing ground, and that fewer people each year are really committed to them. And that is reflected in the church. Do you see that as well? And are you hopeful of where we're headed? Uh, That latter part of the question is the toughest one. It's always nice to say, yes, I'm very confident and I'm very hopeful. But I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better, Jim, because the seeds of discontent have already been sown. The malcontents, the discontents, the language. You know, 30, 40 years ago, Ted Turner in a talk said, once we get television, you know, and the United Nations, this ability to mass communicate will give us more of a chance to find solutions and answers. All that mass communication has done is created more dissent, more disturbing ideas we communicate. So uh, what's happened, I think, somehow society has not connected the dots. We took God out of the schools. We took prayer out of the schools. We've mocked the Christian faith. And look at us now, politically. When is the last time you heard a civil discourse going on between two opposing views? We We're can't in even chaos be, today. Yeah, cannot even be civil anymore. If I saw my father and mother talking like that to each other, I'd say my home is in trouble. We're broken. And today's paper, I read how the attorney general is calling for an end to all these lawsuits and single judges making decisions on ideas that are basically handcuffing the government from doing its business. The collapse of law and the exaltation of individual autocracy has taken over and civility is gone. People all over the world say to me, what has happened to America? Some issues morally, even communist countries 
are taking a stand against, that we have surrendered to and given up. We have become an ill-defined culture. We have no longer a chart or a compass, and we're on the high seas. Ravi, we can't long stand with that occurring. This is largely, almost entirely, a spiritual problem. It is. I have absolutely no doubt it is, because the foundation on which our culture is now built has been shattered. Look at it this way, Jim. What is culture? It's an attempt to find a coherent set of answers to the existential questions of our times and shared meanings of the past, okay? Find answers, coherent answers, to the questions that are existentially troubling with a shared meaning of the past. Where is the shared meaning in this culture? We have become so pluralistic and divisive. There are no shared meanings anymore. What do you do when you're a family? You go back and talk about the past wonderful times you had. You look at the pictures of raising the kids. You have the memories of all that binds us together. You talk to people today, the average and millennial today, for example, uh, do they really even know what 9-11 was all about? They don't know these memories yeah. of all that happened. Yeah. So things that were shattering to this culture are no longer shared meanings of the past. And so I think we have got a culture in a cauldron of uh, discontent. We don't know what we have in common. We have almost nothing in common anymore. So we make decisions ad hoc. And when you make a decision ad hoc, there's not a prior commitment to a certain set of values. And when you forget those shared values, all of the judgments that are based, who would have ever thought that we'd be discussing at the highest level in political uh, electoral offices whether it's okay to kill a baby after the baby is born. Uh, who would have ever thought that? Yeah, who you know, would have? once upon a time, we would have seen this as so atrocious. Now we see this as exalted thinking. Self-evident truths are no longer self-evident because there are no longer truths. And who would have believed that the marriage, which goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, that was God's gift right. uh, to us and to men and women, that it would be thrown aside and redefined that six Supreme Court justices would override the efforts of 31 states to put marriage into their constitutions, override that and force them to believe something that they don't believe. Uh, who would have ever thought that was going to happen? No, and you know, it's happened over the last 50 years, I think, Jim, started in the mid-60s. But I'll tell you this. What this has resulted in is a lot of young people at a junior high level who are wanting to know why they should not even take their own lives. There's an emptiness. They know there are no answers in the education system. They know that. They're just being emboldened to do whatever they want to do. And so what I say to you, the reason that there is hope, I think, is twofold. Number one, the honest sense of even the millennials who are transparent will sit around a table and talk to you and they will admit that their lives are empty. So once you accept that there is an emptiness, there is a hope that something yeah. can come through. Secondly, all it takes is a sudden reformer to emerge on the scene and somebody's life changes who changes history. That's why programs like yours are important. That's why the ministry is like Summit, and I pray to God what we do is important, because you never know whose life is going to change. When Billy Graham was led to the Lord, nobody had a dream of what this man was going to do. So also with Wesley, so also with Spurgeon, so also with Wilberforce. And so someday, God is going to raise up a voice, and these programs need to go on. I meet people who say, you know, I've been listening to you for the last 30 years, listening to you for the last 35 mm -hmm. years. So when they're young and listen, a heart is being brought into tune. So there is hope, but it is going to be a very steep climb. We will have to go through the Calvary of our culture before we get to the empty tomb. Change home. occurs in a crisis. I don't see a revival coming until the people are crying out, right. as right. we just talked about. And so it has to begin in the house of the Lord. When the book of the law was lost, it was the house of the Lord. When Jesus was lost, they had forgotten him at the temple. And oftentimes we lose it right in the house mm -hmm. of God. And if that changes uh, and the church begins to have the conviction and the compassion and the communication skills, 
So we have got a bit of a journey to cover, but Do I don't Do you see lose any hope. evidence of a revival? Well, you know, the thing I see is what is fascinating as to where it is happening. The church in Iran is in a remarkable growth phase. It is the second fastest growing church in the world today. When we speak in Egypt, the places are packed. There are thousands who are attending because they've seen how fed up they are with their bureaucrats in religion. And when we go to any part of the world, uh, we, I just spoke in Bali uh, 10 days ago, Indonesia, overflow crowd in Bali, which is 90 some percent Hindu, overflow crowd in Trivandrum, huge crowd in Calcutta, and everywhere I spoke to our troops, started this trip, started the beginning of August. I was in Germany uh, speaking to our troops. And to have members of our armed forces packing an auditorium out and then asking questions. I think what this says to me, Jim, is that there is a hunger. I see that hunger. But to galvanize it into a revival may take time, but that's God's prerogative. Let me put it this way with mm. closing. I read a beautiful essay by my favorite essayist, F.W. Borum. He calls it the candle and the bird. And he says, if you snuff out a candle, the light is gone. If you frighten away a bird, it goes and sings its song on another bough. He said, the work of the Holy Spirit is more like a bird than the candle. You cannot extinguish his work. He'll go and do his work on another bough. So I see what God is doing is singing his song on different boughs. But the work that America did in years gone by was not in vain. Think of the blessing to China that the American church was, the blessing to the Indo-China context of Vietnam, Cambodia, where the church blossomed because the effort of American missionaries. I think they are coming back now to plant the seeds and change this culture back. Oh, that is so meaningful. I, uh, I want to implore our listeners to be in prayer for our country to call for a revival, to call for a return to the, the fundamentals of our faith, and to even call for this next election that's coming. Uh, and we're not just talking about a presidential election. We're talking about all the leaders of the various uh, states and the enterprises. And all of that's in turmoil, too. It, it just seems like the whole nation is writhing in pain. Or at least that's the way it seems to me. Hopefully, and then it'll give birth to something better. Ravi, I love you. Can I pray for you right yeah, now? That would be a great honor, sir. I love you, too, and Shirley. Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing this man not only into my life and Shirley's life, but the lives of millions of people around the world. I thank you for bringing him out of India and to the United States with a mission and a purpose to teach apologetics far and wide. Lord, he's got the courage, he has the intelligence, he has the verbal skills, and he has the commitment to continue to uh, spread the gospel of Jesus Christ across the nation and around the world. I pray that you will keep him healthy. I pray that you will keep him safe. I pray for his wife, Margie, and that you will just uh, put your hands on them. Uh, yeah. They've had some physical problems. I thank you for bringing them uh, to this point where Ravi can go to five countries just in the last few weeks uh, because you're still using him. I put him in your hands and the entire staff. Uh, Lord, send the money they need to do this job and keep them safe. Lord, keep your hand um, of influence and ordination on them during this crisis, uh, really a world crisis that we're seeing today. And I thank you for bringing him here to Family Talk today. In thy name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'm Roger Marsh. I hope you've enjoyed this powerful two-day broadcast featuring Ravi Zacharias here on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. We pray that Ravi's words embolden you to stand firm in your faith with grace and love. Visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org for information about the various ministries that Ravi Zacharias leads. There you'll also see a link to his newest book called The Logic of God. You'll find all that and much more by going to drjamesdobson.org and then clicking onto today's broadcast page. 
We'd love to hear your thoughts on these two insightful broadcasts featuring Dr. Dobson and Ravi Zacharias. The best way you can do so is to visit our Facebook page. Find our profile by searching for Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk when you go to Facebook.com and then comment on the broadcast posts. Well, thanks for listening today right here on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. This is James Dobson again. Before we go, I'd like to remind you that Family Talk is a listener-supported program. If you've enjoyed this broadcast, we'd appreciate your helping to keep us on the air. As you know, we talk about everything from religious liberty to the sanctity of human life and raising boys and girls, among others. Uh, These are the passions of our hearts, and I hope they are for you, too. Thank you so much for listening and for being part of this ministry. For more information, go to drjamesdobson.org.